Good evening, everyone. It is great to see all you smart people who showed up tonight. Um, you're in for um, a terrific evening, but I'm not going to introduce our um, speaker. Our director of the Teaching Center is going to be doing that, but before I uh, bring her up, one of the things we're going to do tonight is if you have a question for Dr. Amy or Ewing, we're going to be passing out some post-it notes down the aisles, and you can write something, and we'll collect them, and then we'll ask questions to her that way at the end of her talk. But let me open us up right now in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for the witness of your mother. Because we wouldn't know so many things if she hadn't told them to Luke and if she hadn't been there at the cross to see you die. And what an important person she is. And thank you for the opportunity this evening um, to learn a little bit more about your mother, Mary, and what she has done. And thank you for the people who are gathered here to listen to Amy, to grow deeper in their faith. And so we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon Amy as she speaks would your same spirit enliven our minds and our hearts with joy for you, Lord Jesus? Because not only are you our Savior, but you're also the Lord of our life and our leader in this world. And it's in your name we give you thanks and praise this evening. Amen. All right, so I am going to ask Kira Moment Pettit to come up and introduce our speaker. If you haven't met Kira yet, she's the director of our teaching center. And it's been my pleasure to work with her over the last couple of months. And let me just say this about her. She's brilliant. Thank you, Reagan. And thank you all for joining us for this exciting event. I had the privilege of getting to drive to Hobby um, Airport for the first time today. Um, I cho chose the scenic route, so I went past the bayou and I got to pick up our speaker for tonight. So I wanted to read you some of her accolades because she, I think, would not be someone that would tell us, um, but there's a lot of them. Um, so she is an international author, speaker, and theologian who addresses the deep questions of our day with meaningful answers found in the Christian faith. Dr. Amy Orr Ewing is the author of multiple books, including Where is God and All the Suffering? and the best-selling Why Trust the Bible. Over the last 20 years... Amy has given talks and answered questions on university campuses around the world. She has also addressed parliamentarians in the speakers' rooms and chapel at the UK Parliament and staffers on Capitol Hill and at the West Wing of the White House. She regu regularly responds to invitations to speak in banks, businesses, and consultancy firms, as well as churches and conferences and enjoys broadcasting in the media and giving public lectures. So tomorrow she'll be recording a podcast that I'm sure we can all enjoy listening to later. Amy is interested in the intersection of questions of meaning and faith within the marketplace, education, and policy making. She holds a doctorate in theology from the University of Oxford, and she serves as honorary lecturer in divinity at the University of Aberdeen. She lives near Oxford with her husband, Frog, and I hope that she will explain his nickname to us tonight, and their three sons. Ton um, tonight is the last night of her two-week tour in the States, and we're so privileged to get to welcome Dr. Amy Orr Ewing tonight. So let's welcome her together.
Well, thank you for that amazing welcome. And um, let me just start by saying it's an absolute joy to be in Texas. It is always a joy to be in Texas. The hospitality is huge and renowned around the world. And I'd love to just give a particular thanks to Stephanie and Reagan for your friendship and hospitality and the welcome here. And of course, to all the team here at the church. So I'd love to um, share a little bit with you in this, in this Sumner lecture um, about the person Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you can see up here that um, that's the, 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 the title of my latest book is Mary's Voice. And I wanted just to begin our evening together by reading a few words from the introduction of the book to give you a little bit of a flavor um, of what this book is about. And then I'll share a little bit about um, Mary and some important kind of discoveries that I made and, and emphases, I guess, along the way in the book and a little bit about the process of putting the book together as well, if that's okay. And then we will have time for questions at the end. So here's a few words from the introduction. Imagine being a young woman in a forgotten corner of an occupied country, oppressed by a powerful empire. Imagine being a woman at a time when a woman's voice meant nothing. And now think for a moment about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Centering a woman's perspective at Christmas is about far more than empathizing with the eye-watering feats of planning that go into pulling off seasonal festivities. Paying heed to a woman's viewpoint is necessary if we are going to truly celebrate Christmas because the central character of the Christmas story, other than the baby Jesus, is a woman named Mary. At Christmas time, we remember that an ordinary, young, poor woman was chosen to play a significant and breakthrough role in the redemption of the world. Evil would be crushed and defeated through her seed. Her body was to play a part in showing the world that Jesus really is Emmanuel, God with us. And her theological insights and reactions are recorded for us in the New Testament. Now, um, I began that, that reading with that sense, that idea of, of who Mary is, a person who's living under occupation. She obviously li lived in Israel and the Roman Empire had, had come and occupied where she lived. And um, that resonated with me because my father was born during the Second World War and my grandparents in 1948 escaped Soviet occupation of where they lived. And um, my grandmother described uh, what, what that was like. I remember one conversation with her when I was a teenager and I just put on a tiny bit of makeup on my face and she just suddenly said, oh my goodness, you know, when, when we lived back in that, in that place and the Soviets came and occupied, everybody, all the women in, in the town used to put flour on their faces to make themselves look old so they wouldn't catch the attention of, of one of the soldiers. So in 1948, my grandfather was a scientist and the British sent a small plane and my grandparents, my father and my aunt got into this tiny aeroplane and landed at RAF North Holt, which is an air base about 20 minutes from where I now live. And they landed um, and got out of that plane just literally in the clothes they were standing up in. That's how they came to Britain. It's a, it's a shocking thought, isn't it, when you begin to imagine what it would have been like for a young woman to live under the layers of oppression that Mary experienced. Now, when we think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, we'll probably have different, I guess, cultural experiences that we bring to our perception of her. 
Um, I wasn't born into a, a Christian family. My, my um, grandfather that I mentioned was an atheist and such a committed atheist that he forbade any use of the word God in the house and no Bible was allowed to th cross the threshold of the home. That's the context my dad grew up in. My father went on to become an academic himself um, and taught in various universities around the world, including a couple of universities here in America, and then settled in Australia, where he had a teaching post at the University of New South Wales. And um, he'd got to a point in his life, in his 30s, where he was married and they had a lovely house, they had a great lifestyle near the beach, really nice climate, more like Texas than London. You know, the sun occasionally shines here in November, the same cannot be said for where we live now. And um, he had obviously two fantastic children and had reached a point in life where he sort of thought, well, I've, I've acquired what I thought this life was about. You know, financial security, intellectual fulfillment in his job. And a question occurred to him that worried him. And the question was, when you get to retirement age and you're 65, you look back on your life, will what you have now be enough? And that question led him on a search, and through that search, he ended up encountering the Lord Jesus. And um, my, my mother was less than excited about her husband's conversion to the Christian faith. And so when my dad said to her, Jane, I'm too embarrassed to go to church on my own. Please, will you come with me? She, um, she said she thought to herself, I know my husband is intelligent. I know how I can cure him of Christianity. So having grown up in Britain and gone to boarding school and having rejected the sort of nominal faith of, of her childhood, my mother said to my father, I'll only come to church with you if it's Anglican, thinking once he's experienced that, he'll be fine. He'll be cured for life. <laughs> Now, I can say that because my father went on to become ordained in the Church of England, and my husband is ordained in the Church of England as well. So in the tradition of the church that I grew up in, a Protestant tradition, um, Mary wasn't really thought about much or mentioned very much. Um, obviously, more Catholic traditions would have a, a, a higher emphasis on Mary. In fact, um, in the school I went to, and in the state schools in Britain, this is the normal practice at Christmas time. Every child would be involved in a nativity play, a reenactment of the nativity story. And, you know, every, every child would play a different role. And one year you might be a horse or, you know, some sort of animal at the nativity. And if you're really lucky, you might be a shepherd or king. And if you're really lucky, you might be Mary or Joseph. And once in my whole childhood, I got to play Mary. And for the entire hour-long production, I didn't utter a word. Mary, in our imagination, is a mute figure often. Perhaps we imagine her in the pre-Renaissance paintings that, that maybe we've seen or we've just seen reproductions of them, glimpses of Mary hovering, you know, not really in the real world with always a blue dress and a perfect beatific smile and holding a cherubic baby. So Mary is a remote figure and often a silent figure. Yet, Mary in Luke's Gospel is described as a woman who exercised choice, who questioned things, who reflected, who spoke up, and who demonstrated great faith. Mary had a voice. And I can remember exactly where I was when I first truly listened to Mary's voice. And this is really the beginning of, of the process of writing this book. I had um, taken on the um, role of supporting a person who had been abused as a child and who had um, gone to the police uh, as an adult um, sharing the experience that, that she had gone through, the horrific trauma that she had gone through many years earlier. 
The perpetrator was a high profile person in, um, in British society. And very unusually, because this often does not happen, many people do not experience criminal justice um, who've, who've gone through similar experiences, but very unusually, this individual's case was taken by the Crown Prosecution Service and there was going to be a criminal trial and I'd agreed to go and attend the trial every day. So I was in the public witness gallery and you're just hearing um, the trauma recounted and then seeing the different witnesses obviously being cross-examined, which is a very difficult experience for, for everybody involved. And on the second or third day of the trial, I was asking the question, God, where are you? And I was praying, God, please, can there be justice? And I felt overwhelmed by the darkness of this world. And I decided to go um, to the cathedral in the city that was happening far away from where I live. And I decided to go into the cathedral and just sit and pray in the presence of God. And it happened to be during Evensong, or Evensong was about to start, a beautiful liturgical service. All of you wonderful Episcopalians and Anglicans and others here will, will know. And I wasn't particularly following the service, but I happened to look down at the sheet just as the choir got up to sing, and they were singing a beautiful um, choral arrangement of Mary's Magnificat. And as I looked at the sheet, they sang the words, he has brought the rulers down from their thrones and he will exalt them of low degree. That statement from Mary's Magnificat kind of hit me between the eyes in that moment. Her words expressing hope on behalf of the poor the humble and the powerless felt especially meaningful that evening in the aftermath of the horrors of the trauma recounted in that courtroom. And that was the beginning for me of realizing I've never listened to Mary's voice. I've been a Christian for four decades, been a theologian for two and a half decades, and I hadn't truly engaged with Mary's voice. So I want to just draw out a few key themes, um, and I've realized that I've forgotten to press the clicker, having dropped it, so sorry about that, not very professional. And um, here I've just put up on the, on, the, um, on the PowerPoint the words of the Magnificat, which I'm sure you will be familiar with. But the first thing I want to suggest um, that we see about Mary is that She's anointed for a particular role, and that happens as the fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy is fulfilled. So Mary was a Jewish woman. She would have been steeped in the scriptures from childhood. And as such, she may have known the prophecy given to the prophet Isaiah a few hundred years before her life in chapter 7 and verse 14 that the Lord himself will give you a sign the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and he will call him you will call him Emmanuel and that means God with us so it had been prophesied long ago in the history of Mary's people that one day God was going to enter his own creation he was going to enter space, time, and history and be born of a woman such that people would say when they saw that child, that child is God with us. And the sign that this was no ordinary child, the sign that this child was the one born in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, the sign would be that that child would be born of a virgin. Mary may have known the words of the prophet Isaiah, but she would certainly have known the words spoken in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. As you know, Jewish people, for Jewish people, the Pentateuch would be extremely important and the book of Genesis would be where you would begin learning the Pentateuch. And in Genesis 3 and verse 15, 
Mary's foremother, Eve, is standing before God alongside Adam and alongside the serpent. And the context is that the fall has just happened. So sin and death and disease and all of those difficult things have have entered into the beautiful and good creation. And Eve hears the words that between the seed of the serpent and between the woman's seed, there will be enmity and the serpent will bruise his head and he will strike his heel. So the earliest messianic promise of the Bible, the earliest promise of redemption in the Bible is given to a woman about a woman. Now, um, even in our Western culture today, often when people get married, and this is certainly what I did, I took my husband's name, so the surname or Ewing that is very unpronounceable because it has too many vowels, it's my husband's fault. Um, but traditionally, often that's what would happen. And then if you have children, we have three sons, um, they've all taken, obviously, their father's surname. And that's still fairly common today in Western culture, certainly in the ancient Near East, when these texts are are speaking of a, a person being born or the idea of a seed, the idea of a family line was always envisioned patriarchally. It was always envisioned through the male line. So what is being said by God here is something extraordinary and unique and specific, and it's a prophecy And it's referring to what Mary's experience is going to be. That it will be a biological female seed through whom the one who will utterly crush evil in this world will be born. There won't be a biological male involved. And that, again, will be a sign of what's happening. So Mary may have known the prophecy to Isaiah. She almost certainly would have known the prophecy, the Messianic prophecy in Genesis chapter 3. The earliest scriptures promise that one day a child would be born of a woman, of her seed, who would have absolute authority and power to crush evil in this world. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary at the time of the Bible being written, And it's extraordinary today. By positioning Mary in this way theologically, the Bible is unlike any other book or document of the era. By positioning Mary in this way, the New Testament is unlike any writing of the time. And we can see what kind of person is invited to be a gospel witness teacher of profound theology, an example of simple faith. It's no mistake that a woman gets to play this kind of role. It's written into the prophecies. And it's no mistake that her voice, her questions, her fears, her actions, and her obedience matter. So in the book, um, just a a tiny bit about how it's laid out. Um, That's the first theme I wanted to to touch on about fulfillment fulfillment of prophecy. The book is laid out with an introduction and a conclusion and then a daily reading beginning on the 1st of December and the last reading on Christmas Day on the 25th of December. And it's designed as a journey through the season season of Advent. So you'll know that Advent just in Latin means arrival. And traditionally, it's a time of year as Christians when we think about the first arrival of God, the the incarnation, the Son of God born in history. And we think about that in the light of the second arrival, the second coming of Jesus, as we look to that arrival with hope. And in Advent, we have time as Christians to reflect on what it means and feels like to live between those two arrivings. And that can be an experience of lament. That can be an experience of pain and difficulty as well as as the joy of Christmas Day. And so um, the journey 
through Advent towards that day of celebration of, of, of Christmas is, is a meaningful time for us as Christians. So the book is laid out to help us do that, to journey through Advent and really taking that lens of Mary's voice and recentering that perspective. So secondly, the second thing I'd love to draw out this evening is this sense that Mary understood reality and she was prepared to pay a cost. You know, sometimes the Christian life um, can be depicted or imagined as this sort of very otherworldly thing. Perhaps we have friends who, who, um, who live on a higher spiritual plane with their head in the clouds. I don't know if you know any people like that. It's said of them sometimes that they're, they're um, so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good, you know. And we feel a sense of spiritual inadequacy if we're anywhere near them. Um, and the fascinating thing about Mary's story is that it's very much rooted in, in reality. This is not head in the cloud stuff. We've considered what it, life might have been like for a young woman living in an insignificant district. Remember Nazareth, what good can come from Nazareth, a total non-place, a tiny town, an insignificant place in an occupied country under the control of the most powerful empire the world has ever known. And then think what it would be like to be a woman at a time when a woman's voice meant nothing. Literally, in a Greco-Roman court of law, a woman couldn't be a witness. You needed a male witness to testify. And in the rabbinic literature of the first century, you see a similar regard for women. So Mary's living under these different layers of oppression. That's her context. I don't know how much um, you are following the war in Ukraine, but um, obviously it's closer to home for us. And when war first broke out in Ukraine, um, many of the Christians in Britain and other groups lobbied the government that we would open our borders to receive um, the women and children, refugees, fleeing that conflict. And people in churches offer to open their homes and have um, Ukrainian refugees staying with them for, and the initial commitment was for a year. My husband and I had the privilege of welcoming two Ukrainian women to come and live at our farm. One lady in her 80s who had never left the home and they had a um, like a homestead, a small holding farm where they grew flowers and vegetables that were sold, produce that were sold and that, that lady had never left her home. And her daughter in her 60s and um, when, the, uh, when the Russian troops came and arrived at um, where these ladies live, thing, lots of things were decimated, their, um, their farmland, and they, they had to flee. And they had to flee with just the clothes they're standing up in in a small bag, pay all their savings to a people trafficker to take them to the Polish border, and from there they got on a Red Cross flight and flew to Britain. Um, what an extraordinary privilege to sit and talk with those two ladies and hear their experience. That was Mary's context, living under occupation. Now in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse from verse 28 onwards, there's a description of Mary encountering an angel, an angelic visitor, and the angel Gabriel begins by saying, Mary, you are highly favored. Now, I don't know about you, but I think if I was Mary, I'd have pretty good reason to say, I don't feel highly favored. Have you heard about the political situation where I live? Do you know what it feels like to be a woman living under this kind of patriarchy and the, the oppression that a woman felt at that time? But Gabriel tells her, you are highly favored and that the Lord is with her. 
Now let's just stop there for a moment and consider. Are we able to hear what that might mean in our context? I meet, um, through my work, I meet many people who have no faith at all, many people who do have Christian faith, and, me and, and some who used to have a Christian faith but who've walked away from it. And very frequently those who've walked away from their faith, one of the reasons has been a sense of disappointment in God that somehow their relationship with God didn't deliver them from suffering or lack or didn't give them something that, that they felt they, they wanted to, had wanted deeply and had prayed for. It's a very common experience. Mary, you are highly favored, says the angel Gabriel. What does that say to us in our cultural moment? I think it raises a question. Have we in the West equated the favor and blessing of God with an experience of successfully fulfilling the American dream or the British equivalent? Have we equated having all of our prayers answered and living in a conscious, constantly spacious place, hashtag blessed, with knowing the favor of God? If Mary could be called favored and that be her life experience, I think that says something profound to us in our cultural moment. Will we hear the verdict of God over our lives or Will we insist on achieving the success metrics of our cultural moment? Or will we insist that every desire that we've prayed for must be fulfilled before we will agree or believe that we've had the blessing or favor of God? Highly favored. Mary is poor, young, insignificant, and the citizen of an occupied country. And then Gabriel says, there's more. You're going to be pregnant. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and not only are you going to be pregnant, you're unmarried and you're going to be pregnant. Mary is now going to be an unmarried pregnant teenager. I wonder if we've misunderstood the favor of God. She is told she will miraculously have a child who will be the son of the Most High. There is no question in the text who the identity of this child she is going to have actually is. He's going to be called Emmanuel, God with us. He will be the son of the Most High. She's told the child she will have will reign on David's throne. In other words, he's coming in the Davidic line of messianic prophecies we've already talked about. He will reign on David's throne. Now, lest Mary think like others began to think at the time of Jesus that perhaps the fulfillment of Jesus' destiny might be political leadership, re-establishing David's throne, re-establishing a civic nation state that was no longer under occupation. The prophecy goes on from Gabriel, his kingdom will never end. This is the promise of who Jesus will be, God's son here on earth, reigning eternally. The heart of the incarnation is captured in these words to Mary, which she in turn recounts to Luke. Her son, who will be born from her womb, her seed, her egg, and carried and delivered from her body, will be such a great king that his kingdom will be eternal. That is the wonder of the incarnation, the eternal God born in history. Now Luke reflects and records that Mary was worried when she heard this. The text says that she was troubled and she was afraid upon hearing these words. That is a reaction that rings true. The awesome revelation of who Jesus Christ is going to be, the eternal ruler born in history, given to a simple teenage girl, quite naturally, she's astonished. 
The Bible is not a piece of mythic literature that makes sense if you just get into the religious bubble and it's internally coherent. You know, sometimes I think people imagine that that the people perhaps who aren't aren't so familiar with the text imagine that the Bible is a bit like a a dream. You know, when you're asleep and you're having a dream and weird things happen, but you don't question them happening because you're in a dream. So someone might fly around or appear somewhere or just... Uh, go from A to B with, without any rhyme or reason, and you don't worry about it, you don't question it, because you go with it in the dream. People think that's what religious literature is like and what it's about. That's not what we have here. We don't have Mary saying, we're in the Bible now, it must be a virgin conception, that's completely normal. No, she questions it. And her question reflects her intelligence. She says, how can this be since I am a virgin? In other words, Mary understands human biology. She knows the basics of reproduction. And she knows what her culture thinks of unmarried mothers. Mary questions. Mary is afraid. The cost is real. Her head is not in the skies here. But her reply shows that she believes that what she has heard will come to pass. Her fear is natural and it's acknowledged. But this is what she says. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. What outstanding faith. But faith is enacted in reality, not faith disconnected from cost and not faith disconnected from the real natural world. Thirdly, Mary used her voice. Mary is a witness. On one of the days of of the book, I spend the whole um, four pages of my little devotional writing Um, unpacking a seemingly insignificant phrase in Luke 1 verse 46. Three words, and Mary said. And Mary said. Now, one of the things that I think is, is most wonderful and amazing when we look at Luke's gospel is if you look at the beginning of Luke's gospel, he describes his methodology in writing. So he talks, he's writing to a person called Theophilus, and Luke describes himself as a Gentile, a doctor. He's a man of science, and he's not a person who was a first-hand eyewitness himself to the life of Jesus. So Luke didn't travel with the disciples and see all the parables and miracles of Jesus that the Gospels describe. But what he did is carefully investigate everything from the beginning. That's how he describes it. And he says, um, I I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, most excellent Theophilus. It seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you so that you could know the certainty of the things you've been taught. So Luke speaks to the eyewitnesses and he interrogates the sources. Now tradition tells us that Luke's primary eyewitness source is Mary, the mother of Jesus. So Mary is one of the eyewitnesses Luke is drawing on. And so we have her perspective, and we see that, obviously, right at the beginning, where this, the birth narrative and account of, of, of um, the Annunciation, of the Incarnation, and all of that had to have been primarily uh, witnessed by Mary since she was alone when it happened. But we don't just have Mary's testimony included in Luke's Gospel. We also have her direct speech That makes the New Testament unlike any other equivalent document of the era. To have the speech of a first century woman recorded and preserved for us is astonishing in literary and historical terms. It's very, very unusual. And it it tells us a lot about the nature of the New Testament, who gets to be included. 
the outsider and the people considered lesser, for example. But in the Magnificat, we have the longest speech of any woman in the New Testament. And from it, it is clear that Mary knew the Old Testament. She follows long established patterns of prophecy and praise. Her witness is articulate. Her witness is pointing towards who Jesus is going to be. And her witness draws on the scriptures. She quotes from Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel. She quotes from the Psalms. And she even cites an incident in the book of Exodus about God's arm not being too short to save. Mary uses her voice. And as she does, she bears witness to who God is. As we read Mary's words of prophecy and hope today, our own relative positions of education, privilege, wealth and opportunity might make it difficult to see how what she says is good news. How could it be good news to hear the hungry will be filled with good things and the rich be sent away empty if we have wealth? How could it be good news to hear the rulers will be torn down from their thrones and God will exalt them of low degree if we have power? How could it be good news to hear that the proud will be scattered in the machinations, the thoughts of their hearts? If we experience privilege, it can be hard to really see Mary's Magnificat as good news. If we're well-fed, rich, and respected, we may struggle to see the goodness and liberty promised in Mary's witness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and theologian. He was executed by the Nazis for his part in the plot on Hitler's life. And he found himself caught between his love for his country and his felt need to resist the evil that had overtaken Germany. As a young pastor, he used to host university students in his home at his table and give food to them and called it table talk, a bit like Martin Luther. And he offered Christian hospitality and and offered conversation about the Christian faith. My atheist grandfather, who I told you about earlier in the talk, attended meetings in the Bonhoeffer House as a university student in the 1920s. Bonhoeffer did resist the power structures of Nazism, and this is what he said about the Magnificat. He called Mary's song the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary hymn ever sung to the lowly, to the oppressed, to the abused, to the vulnerable and the powerless, Mary's words are a statement of hope and are very much in tune with God's heart through the scriptures. Mary's witness points us towards Jesus and to what he has come into this world to do. And then just the last point I wanted to make, sorry, I... um, Need to flick through. Mary read the power discourses of this world and defiantly believed that Jesus Christ is the hope of humanity. He has brought the rulers down from their thrones. Now, remember, often with um, the Old Testament format of prophecy, it would come in the past tense even as a future hope. So you see that in Isaiah as well. That's just a, a pattern of how things are. And that Greek word for ruler is the word dunastes, and it's rooted in the idea of power. You and I may not fear traditional kings or presidents or mayors or congressional leaders or judges or prime ministers. We may not fear the people who exercise authority in the nations and neighborhoods that we live in. And that will be especially true if we live in freedom 
under democracy. But even in our contexts, there are other kind, kinds of power closer to home. The domestic bully who rules their household instilling fear and wielding power by domination. Perhaps some of us have friends who've experienced domestic violence or partner violence in a relationship. Perhaps some of us have had a parent who could never be contradicted and had always to be acquiesced to. Maybe some of us have worked in an organization or workplace where the boss or the power structure supervising us was truly toxic. A ruler on a throne, in Mary's words, is speaking of a dominator who evokes fear, a person who abuses others. And any of us who've been on the receiving end of power abuse will recognize the hope in Mary's statement. Mary points us to a hope in Jesus and to a God of justice and truth, a God of goodness and beauty. So that if we have been abused or taken advantage of or crushed or trampled underfoot by ego or domination or power of any sort, our hearts can thrill like Mary's did at the presence of the Lord and at the coming of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the one who can be trusted with power, the one whose second arrival and second coming causes us to look forward to the future with hope that the unjust power structures of this world will not always hold sway. And so we need not live under them, crushed by them, because we can look to Jesus. In her Magnificat, Mary declares her hope in the promise that Jesus has come into this world to rescue and deliver and our hearts can thrill at that, even when we walk through the darkest of times. So despite her lack of formal education, Mary's theological contribution as a witness and as a theological reflector should not be underestimated. Her Magnificat is seen after Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount as a key and core piece of Christian ethical teaching in the New Testament. Mary's knowledge of the Old Testament and reflection on the meaning of the events she participated in enable us as Christians today, as we approach Advent, to wonder again at the redemptive plans of God for this world. Her song, the Magnificat, draws on the truths of the Old Testament and the prophecies of the ministry of the, of the Messiah. Mary is the only person to be present with Jesus at his birth, comforting him, and at his death, comforting him then. And she stands as a key historic eyewitness at both moments. What did Mary do with the rest of her life? Well, the writings that still um, exist from, from the early church um, suggest that Mary continued to point people to Jesus, that she used her voice and her gifts to serve in the early church. Mary was a witness, a teacher, a leader, and a mother, and her voice mattered greatly to Jesus and it meant something in the early church the portraits the early portraits of Mary in Christian art and iconography appear to have slowly changed over the years from her being seen as a liturgical leader with her arms raised in blessing and proclamation and her head up and then slowly over the years, the depiction of her moves into a silent woman expressing her submission by her eyes looking to the floor. But remember that her voice 
recorded in the Magnificat, has that note of defiance and hope. Yet somehow the silent Mary, the perfect mother, or the ideal, the unattainable ideal of purity, became a feminine cultural ideal for women. Mary's own voice says something different. She was a person of courage and faith, a woman who knew the scriptures and willingly consented to step into a significant role in the salvation history of the world. But most importantly, Mary always ultimately seems to point us away from herself and toward her son, the longed for Messiah. And in so doing, she shows herself to be a witness, an evangelist, a pastor. So the four things I, I wanted to mention were the fulfillment of prophecy, the way Mary understood reality and was prepared to pay a cost, Mary's use of her voice as a witness and her understanding of the power discourses of her day. I hope you will enjoy Mary's voice, perhaps give it as a gift to others. Every day there's a devotional, a prayer, and a piece of Christian art, a reproduction of a piece of art. Please let your friends and relatives know about it. It's a beautiful book. I'd love to sign a book for you afterwards and meet you if you would like to. And thank you so much for your wonderful, generous texts and hospitality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Stephanie is going to be coming around collecting any questions that you might have, but I wanted to start with uh, one of my own. Um, so some traditions really um, emphasize, as you've talked about, this kind of submissive side of things, but also um, the Immaculate Conception of Mary and her own kind of perfect childhood. I wonder if you could speak to um, the, the outcome that might happen when we imagine Mary as just a normal girl like we were when we were kids. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, the, the desire to sort of envisage an immaculate conception for, for Mary, the, the logical problem with that is that you just keep have to go keep going yes. back till eventually you get to Eve and you realize, well, Genesis 3 happened, <laughs> the fall is there um, in our biological lineage. And of course, there, there isn't a basis in scripture for that idea. But I think it's, it's well meant. It's a desire right. to, to honor Mary, but it's... Um, it's kind of mistaken. And actually what we see in, in the text is very much this sense of a person, a person who has questions, a person who expresses fear, a person who um, is going to suffer greatly. Um, the, the, the interaction, one of the very moving interactions that Mary experiences when she brings Jesus into the temple and... Um, I'm sure you know there's this old man called Simeon who has um, been in the temple for his whole life, day, going in and out, and he felt he'd been promised by God that he would see the redemption of Israel, that he would lay eyes on the Messiah. So this is a person who's in the temple courts, very busy place. Everyone brought their child there to be blessed. He's seen thousands of families, and he sees the Holy Family. And when he lays eyes on them, it's really interesting. The text says that he went and took the child from Mary. Now, I have um, my firstborn, our twins. My dear, dear American friend said to me, Amy, you're such an overachiever. <laughs> which I took as a compliment, I think. I mean, it's quite hard having twin babies, but I remember as a, as a we call it a vicar, I guess you call the, the, the vicar here the priest, is that, is that what you say? Um, so my husband is, is vicar, and so in the church, people would very much want to hold your baby because you're, you're kind of part of the church family. And I, I remember that anxiety of people sort of taking your child from you. And particularly I had two trying to just keep track of, of where they were. <laughs> and um, 
And it's notable to a young mother, someone, an old man coming and taking your child. And then Simeon begins to speak these amazing words of prophecy over Jesus. And of course, we have the nunc dimittis. Now your servant can, de can depart this world in peace for my eyes have seen the glory of the king. You think, my word, poor Mary. I mean, he's literally saying, now I've held your child, I can die happily. <laughs> Quite melodramatic. So Mary remember, you know, remembers this. And then he turns to Mary and he prophesies, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The prophecy of the tremendous suffering this woman is going to experience. And so I, I think... Um, the way the New Testament describes Mary and her own words as well encourage us to see her as a person, not an icon floating in the clouds, and, and to actually listen to her words and her witness, which are really robust and meaty and actually point us to Jesus. Thanks, Amy. So we have a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, One of them more basically was, where are your parents and grandparents from? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so my mother is English and my grandparents are German and they were in, they lived in Berlin. And um, so my grandfather had actually been out to America and worked out here on research projects um, and then had moved back and was in Germany in the war during the war. Um, but when Berlin was obviously divided up by the Allies, um, they were, were the, the town that was just just outside Berlin where they were was was under um, Soviet occupation. And amazingly, um, about ten years ago, you know, maybe about fifteen years ago, the German government got back in touch with my father and all the land and, and property that had been taken by, by the communists was given back to the descendants of, of, of the relatives. So um, that was very amazing German record keeping and incredible administrative skill, but quite, quite a drama to sort out. So my grandparents lived in, um, in the UK. My grandfather had the rest of his career as a scientist in the UK and then in retirement moved back to West Germany um, and my aunt was a professional violinist but for her whole career could never go and play with the orchestra behind the Iron Curtain until the Berlin Wall fell because any of us, I mean my sister and I could never go to an Eastern European country either because you would have been repatriated, that was the situation. And it's not that long ago. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, another question we have is about the apparitions of Mary and what your take might be. So Fatima and other places where people have seen mm -hmm. Mary appear to them and maybe kind of around the devotion of Mary. Sure. Um, so really my interest in Mary is more related to the text of scripture and what we do know is, is actually true about her because it's recorded in, in the Gospels and in a sort of um, rigorous way that Luke obviously really researched. And Mary describes herself as treasuring these things, pondering these things in her heart, or you could say committing to memory. And obviously in that culture, there was a, an oral tradition. So there's a discipline around committing to memory. Um, and so... Um, I hesitate to speculate about what's what's going on with that kind of experience, other than to say, if the experience is not actually pointing to people towards Jesus, I would question whether it's genuinely connected to the historical Mary, because that's what her life was about. Her life was about was about who Jesus is and what he'd come into this world to do. Um, so that was very much the priority. And I think you could understand that sort of experience perhaps around a text like we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and if we're, if we're helped by um, imagining those who've gone before us or um, seeing something new in their example, then wonderful. But if we end up venerating 
the individual rather than venerating the Lord himself, we actually undo what the purpose certainly of Mary's life was. So Thanks. that would be my... Yeah, I'm reminded of there's a very famous painting of John the Baptist pointing to Christ. Yes. And you mentioned earlier yeah. that's what Mary's life was yeah. about, was pointing to Christ. Um, another question about Mary specifically. So God silenced Zechariah, leaving Elizabeth and Mary to speak. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Luke realized just how radical he was with Elizabeth as well giving witness to Jesus's identity? Yes, thank so you. Elizabeth and Mary. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's fascinating. And um, this is all touched on in, in, on in the book as well. There's a day on each of these questions. But um, very interesting how Isaac, um, sorry, Zachariah, the priest who has gone into the Holy of Holies and has this extraordinary access to God and is a public figure. So he's, he's a well-known, to be the one priest who's gone into that bit of the temple that year, that tells you beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is a person that everyone in that national group, they, they knew him. Now, he's an old man married to an old woman called Elizabeth, and they had no child. So barrenness was a, was a, a big shame in that culture. So to be that high profile and to have not had a child would be something everyone knew. So Zechariah goes into the presence of God. He has this, um, this word that he's going to have, that Elizabeth in her old age is going to have a child, and he doesn't believe and as a consequence, the child is still born, the gift is still given, but as a consequence, he's, he's struck dumb for, for that entirety of the pregnancy. So a contrast is drawn between the high-ranking, theologically educated, high-prestige, well-known public figure, religious figure, and the teenage girl. And... That's, that's an extraordinary contrast being drawn out, talking, I guess, to how God looks to the heart. And however ordinary or small we feel, God looks to the heart. And he doesn't see in terms of the hierarchies we create. And then the interaction with Elizabeth is fascinating because this was, Elizabeth's pregnancy was huge news. I mean, it's like front page news that this very old couple who everyone knew couldn't have a baby this woman who's definitely been through the menopause, you know, very old, is now having a baby. She's pregnant. And um, they're a public figure. So everyone knew this was, this was an amazing miracle. This was a, a God-given gift. Now, the text um, doesn't suggest that Elizabeth, when she's being visited by her much younger relative who's betrothed to be married at this point, but isn't yet married, when Mary it comes to visit Elizabeth, Elizabeth doesn't know the encounter that Mary's had with the angel Gabriel. And there's no sense that Mary's showing or there's any kind of physical reason why a godly woman like Elizabeth would think my teenage relative is pregnant. There would be no predisposition for her to believe that. But as Mary walks into the house, John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb. Now, I don't know how many of us in this room have been pregnant, but um, I remember towards the end of the twins being born, um, I was so enormous that if I put my hand on my hip like this, my stomach came beyond my fingers. It was absolutely gigantic. And you could see them moving around, you know, the kind of arms. that You, you feel your child moving. So a moving child is not a notable thing. A leaping child in the womb is a notable thing. And then Elizabeth notes that her son has leapt. And then she speaks to Mary, who am I that the mother of my Lord would come to me? An older woman who had social status above a younger woman reverses that and says, I'm honored that you've come to me. And then she calls the unborn child in her teenage relative's womb, my Lord. That is a revelation beyond 
anything natural. And it's another affirmation for Mary, I think, that this is Emmanuel, God with us. The incarnation is, is happening. Thank you, Amy. I think we have time for one last mm -hmm. question. Um, and after this, we'll have a reception just around the corner in the parlor. But um, Amy will also be taking um, book signings if you'd like. So as we're thinking about Mary crushing the head of the serpent, mm -hmm. what are some other ways that we can see God crushing the head of the serpent, crushing yeah. evil today? Yeah. Well, it's not Mary that crushes, that it's her seed, it's Jesus. Remember, it's all about Jesus. The, 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 the crushing of that, of that power of, of evil. So um, I think the only hope for evil being crushed um, is Jesus. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? And it's, it's glorious when we see that. That happens person by her person, um, life change by life change, as people encounter Jesus today. And, you know, the, the machinations of man's heart are turned from evil to good, where where there's been darkness, there can be light. We can see all kinds of examples of that as people bring, um, as we bring our lives before the Lord and he changes us from living purely selfishly to wanting to live for him, to bring that light and truth into this world. We can see evil defeated when, um, when we forgive people who've harmed us greatly. We can see um, evil defeated where, um, where, there's, where there's love and friendship across bonds that have, would previously have been you know, racism or other kinds of hostility. There are many, many ways in which evil is being and has been crushed by Jesus and continues to be as we, his disciples, follow him. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Amy. So we still have a few books for sale that um, uh, Stephanie will be helping us sell. And the reception will just be around the corner. Thank you so much for coming tonight.